All right, dude. Welcome to the interview. This is a friend of mine, Jack Gad, all the way from the UK, correct? Yes, yeah, 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 UK. Yeah, so he's quite the distance from my Canadian self. So introduce yourself, my friend. Tell people what you're all about and uh, kick it off, man. Opposite ends of the world, aren't we? Yeah, yeah. We're, we're a little bit far apart, but we made it work. Yeah. <laughs> um, right, thank you for the intro. So my name is Jack Gad. So I'm a competitive natural bodybuilder. I'm 24 years old. I had to think of my own age then. Um, <laughs> and I'm also a online coach full time. Nice. That's, that's my main thing that I do now. Um, and I've been training for roughly around about, oh, I'd say about six years now. Okay. Um, on and off for the first few years and then a bit more consistent as like, as, as I've kind of grown older, but I'm sure we'll get into that yeah. in, the, uh, in the podcast anyway. So yeah, that's a little bit about me. Um, so yeah. Awesome, dude. Okay, let's kick this off with what got you into bodybuilding? What what got young Jack into the lifting game? It's a funny one because um, I would say, <laughs> I think, I, I think, I've been thinking about that question a little bit because like, it's something I always try and ask myself, like what really got me into bodybuilding? Yeah. And it was one hundred percent on on Schwarzenegger, and as as cliche as that is for a lot of people, because I'm sure everybody has the same thing. But yeah. I remember going; I, I was just I just doing college um, at the time. I was doing public services, which is basically you go and learn about the police, the fire service, okay. the ambulance. So when I got to college, I started seeing like loads of big guys walking around. Yep. Like, it's the first time I'd ever been in that environment where. People, we really cared about our physique because yep. at the time, like, I was into sports. I'd always done sports from an early age. I yep. did mixed martial arts. I did taekwondo, did football, rugby, massive, massive rugby fan. But then suddenly at college, when I arrived, everybody was bigger than me. And I was like, okay, this is, <laughs> this is, this is, I guess, a bit intimidating. Yeah, for sure. And something happened during college. I think it was like, uh, I watched Pumping Iron um, <laughs> and, so from there, it was just like that was it. Yeah. After that, after that movie, it was like now I w- I want to be doing bodybuilding. This is this is something I really really want to do. Cool. Want to get into. So as you do, start dabbling with it, start training, join yeah. the gym, um, and yeah, they kind of took took off from there. Really, that's that was what mainly got me into bodybuilding. Right. Um, and then over time, obviously, my, my aspirations have changed and stuff. Yeah, for sure. So where did you get most of your information when you started, uh, you know, training and stuff? Like, where did you start learning about, okay, you know, if I want to train my chest, this is what I need to do and, and stuff like that? Yeah. I'd say probably it was from the bodybuilder.com forums. Yeah. Um, we all started you just, there. <laughs> you type in the generic things into YouTube. It was how, how, how to build a bigger chest. Yeah. Um, I also remember as well, like, I learned a lot of stuff off of Scott Herman as well. I don't know whether yeah, he follows yep. Scott Herman Fitness. Like, yep. He's got lots of old YouTube videos of how to build a bigger chest. So I started trying his methods. Yep. Um, I made good results, but they probably weren't as good as they, they probably could have been. Yeah. Um, some of the workouts and stuff. <laughs> but yeah, I'd say like the bodybuilder.com forums, they were, they were the main aspirations for me at the time and that was where I took a lot of my information from yep. um, and just and others around me as well so other people that were bigger than me um, and that's something that I've always I've always looked on if like if other people are in a better position than me they look better than me yep. then ask them um, kind of make what friends are you doing? obviously they, they, you take everything with a pinch of salt because not everyone who is big knows yep. what they're talking about yeah but they kind of got there, so they must know something. Right. Yeah, <laughs> so for sure. Started asking a lot of people, made a lot of friends with people in the gym, um, yeah. and just kind of from there developed my knowledge over time. Really um, awesome. So yeah. Cool. Now, when you started, did you follow the typical like chest on Monday, then it was legs, then back, and you just crush it every single workout? Like, I think it's interesting in doing these interviews how everybody kind of starts the same. It's like, okay, I'm just going to annihilate one muscle group every single day till I can't move. Can, can you give a little backstory on that, how your training started? I think, I think anyone who didn't start like that, it's, they, they, they haven't experienced it. Yeah. They, had, they haven't experienced that kind of um, that start to bodybuilding. But yeah, it was chest Mondays, Tuesday was back, yep. shoulders Wednesday, 
arms on a Friday and, and legs on a Thursday and, and literally just rinse. I rinsed and repeat that for a good, good two years. Yep. And I made a lot of progress during that time. Like I, I obviously the bro split now because of the science behind it. Yeah. It does get a lot of stick. But I did actually make some good progress. But like you said, everything was to failure. Yeah. Like everything. Um, <laughs> Risk always... curls to failure. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> And um, I was always looking to do a one RM every session, so I would work up to a hundred kilo on a bench press, yep. fail it one week, work up again, fail again, and then <laughs> just never realised why I was never making any strength progression. Yeah, uh, yeah, I quickly learned like after the two years, and once I started stop taking advice from the wrong people, yeah, then my training really started to come into its element. So. Yeah, how old were you when you really started to get into the gym? Um, so I competed first when I was 21, so I'd say probably a, a year of lifting before that, so I'd say about 19, 19 and a half, that was when I really started to yep. develop my physique, yep. um, a good two years beforehand, just thinking about really, just yeah. not doing what I was meant to be doing or, or doing the most optimal thing, yep. um, but I'd say sort of 19 and a half was when I really started to get going with my trainer. Awesome. What about uh, diet when you first started? Did you pay any mind to that? Or was it just like, I should probably have some more protein at one point in the day? Or, or how did that all start out when you first started? <laughs> I, went, I, I, I went through stages. So during, when I started at college, and like you said, I started getting into actual bodybuilding. Yep. My diet, because I was at college at the time, was terrible. Like We would go on our lunch break, and we had these things called student cards where you would be able to purchase a meal at like McDonald's and you would get the option to get a free McFlurry or a free <laughs> cheeseburger with every meal. Excellent. And I did that every lunchtime for probably a good year. Yeah. Um, and then on our break times, I would again just sausage baguettes, hash browns. I just ate everything. Yeah. Um, and it probably wasn't the best thing. And then like I was very pro with regards to my meals, not when I was at college. So it was all chicken and rice type of yeah. thing. Yep. But then I kind of had a bit of a switch um, at some point when when I left college, and that was when I went on this uh, this mass gain bulk for a good. good Can you get that? <laughs> I made a lot of progress. Like I, you, I've put some stuff up on my Instagram before, but I got incredibly overweight. Yeah. But what I was eating was quite funny. I think my protein intake at one point got to five hundred grams a day. Because I, I was eating probably six meals a day, um, and they were all getting covered in oil. They were all twenty five percent fat beef mints for like every two hours. I, it was yeah, it was not good. I put on a lot of weight, but obviously a lot of that is fat. Yeah, um, some yeah. of it was muscle, and I guess that kind of set me up for to, to cut at some point um, when when I did my first competition cut. <laughs> so for a massive growth stage of just six days a minute. Six, Six meals a day, chicken and rice, yep. oil on everything. Um, just give me all the calories. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. So I think okay. every, everyone's done that at some point over there. Yeah, we. I think it's funny. Like looking back, um, I think we didn't overthink it. You just ate a lot and you went to the gym. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You, you didn't put too much thought into it. Like, okay, I'm hitting chest today. Okay, so I know that's bench press. I know that's incline flies. I know that's cable crossover. And they're gonna go home and eat what's ever in the fridge. Yeah, exactly. And <laughs> I, I think, I think in a way, a lot of young lifters now, they sometimes they read too much into yeah. like, science, and I they agree. kind of miss that stage where they should just be focusing on eating, training, yeah. getting sufficient protein in, recovering. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I guess there's a bit of a catch twenty two in that way. No, I, I agree. Like as a trainer myself, like getting young athletes and stuff coming in, they're like, okay, I want to get bigger. I want to get bigger. Okay, start eating. Yeah. Okay, well, what do I eat? I'm like, don't worry about that right now. You're 17. Who gives a shit? Yeah. Give it two years and then we'll figure it out. Like, I, I agree with what you just said. There's, there's so much information they can read and it's like bombarding them and they're like, I don't know what to do. And then they don't do anything. It's almost too, too much information. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so you started out now... You said you were, what, 21 when you first stepped on stage? Yeah, so I started my first prep back in 2015. Um, it's, it was a shame because that, that year um, I was about, I think I was 
four months older than I needed to be to compete as a junior. Ah. So I had to compete as a novice. So that was my first ever year going into it. Um, and I started out, I, I prepped myself for my first ever show, which was in May of 2015. Yep. Uh, I started dieting in January, so it was a good sort of five, four or five month prep. And I lost roughly about 35 pounds to step on stage at that point. Okay. And yeah, it was, it was really, really good, really, really insightful. But the, the process where I learned as much as I could and I got leaner was, was after that. So during that time for, for the first prep, my cardio was really inconsistent, like as okay. in I would just like, go for a run or I would yeah. go and do bit sprints. That there wasn't really much consistency right. um, with regards to what I was doing. Um, and yeah, so if food, food wise and everything as well, I, I guess I'll probably, and you've probably got a question coming up for that later, I imagine. But my first, the first time I prepped myself for the, for the qualifiers, yeah. that was, it was a fairly bro diet. So it was sweet potato, yeah. chicken, wasn't really much of a if it fits your macros style going into that. Right. It was only after that, once I qualified, I actually, I looked up and got a coach for, the final. So basically, yep. once I qualified in the May, I then had the chance, obviously, to work through June, July, August, September to the finals, okay. and that was when I got a lot leaner. Yep. Um, I learned a lot more about the cardio that I should have been doing. Started incorpor- incorporating more flexible diets and foods into my macros as well. Right, and that was the process where I really did learn a lot about my training, my nutrition when I did get a coach because you do learn. Like, and a lot of your clients will probably understand that as well. When they come to you, they learn after a few months yeah. what they really do it. Yeah, um, and that massively took away from it. Awesome. Um, that season in 2015, I got third in Britain in the novice class. So really really like surprised myself because like i think when you first ever step on stage your expectations are just yeah they're nothing like you don't expect to to really maximize anything you just yeah. kind of the end goal is just stepping on stage yeah. so yeah like kind of really paved the way um for, for this season as such right awesome so where did you get your so the first one you were self-coach where did you get your information from like how did you know um okay if i want to get to the stage i need to do this for the next five months where did you get that information good question good question so um i it was all from lane norton um, oh nice it's his articles on i think it was bodybuilding.com again um it was lane norton and tiger fitness as well so mark mark loveliner um i basically watched his youtube videos i watched lanes and kind of correlated my own my own way of going about the prep. So I used his article about setting up my calories. Yep. Um, and obviously in the article, he goes into about how to change them, how to set up your cardio, yep. brief days. Um, so I basically used all of his free information to, to, to pay my own way for my first prep. Oh, that's cool. Um, and yeah, it was, it was, it was, it was good, good information for, for something that was for free online. Yeah to be able to give me the chance to set up my own diet. Like it was, it was amazing. So yeah, that was where um, I learned all of my stuff for my first prep nice. was, uh, was from Lane Norton and uh, people like Mark Lobliner yep. didn't find Eric Helms and stuff until a little bit later, but I'm sure yeah. we'll touch on. Cool. So speaking a little bit later, so now you've done your first season, I guess you placed third in Britain. Then what, what came next? So then it came, so after the qualifier, the first one in May, yep. I then obviously got my coach. Again, from the, from all the way to the finals, I learned a lot from him. I started doing my own research. So yep. I started researching into why I'm doing these things, why I'm doing this cardio choice. So I started to find people like Alberto Nunez, yep. Eric Helms, um, the likes of the 3GMJ team. So I started to learn a lot then. And then post-show, it was kind of a case of like, this is now my off season. I'm going to absolutely just put on as much muscle <laughs> as I can with all the knowledge that I've gained yeah. because of the, the stuff that I haven't had the last two or three years. Like I had now so much information from yeah. all these people. It, it gave me the best like off season I had. So from 2016 to the start of 2018 was just basically trying to gain as much muscle. Um, yeah. I, I, I mini cut it twice during that period. Right. So I, I spent maybe like 14 weeks of two years mini cutting. Nice. So 
like I, I believe like the last sort of two years I've had in an off season has been has been the best to be honest. So yeah, that's kind of that period post show was just spent learning and yep. developing my physique and then actually getting into the online coaching side of things as well as as my knowledge grew. Awesome. So talk about your off season a little bit. How did you structure that? Training wise, diet wise, get into get into all that. So be, after I finished my prep, so I've, I've only started been doing online coaching for about a year. So my job uh, restricts my training massively. So right. I could only ever train four days a week. Like for the last two years, right. apart from this year, it's been it was four days a week, upper lower splits. Um, and the way I would structure my training is very, very simple. And I've talked about this a lot on Instagram lately about the simplicity of progressive overload yep. and, and, and the systems that I follow. So I'd have them, obviously my, my training splits and then we'd be just going in each week with the goal of progressing my logbook. Yep. Um, single session. So whether that's just like by two and a half kilos on the bar. Yep. Like, just do it. Just do two and a half kilos. You don't need to do, go up massive jumps. Like if you've missed a rep one week, just add another rep the next week, or yep. try your best to add another rep. And that was just basically the, the the way that my off season kind of went through that period. And as I started to get towards 2018, and um, before I started my prep, I started to utilize more things like metabolite work. Um, I switched to more of a high carb, low fat as well um, because. I came out into 2016 when I first started my first proper off season of more knowledgeable yeah. and I just focused on like calories, protein, but as, as again, as your knowledge grows and, and this is, this is the thing, like things change all the time. I'm yeah. never married to one approach. Yeah. Um, things like nutrition and stuff. I, I got very flexible with my diet, like <laughs> way too flexible. Yeah. Um, I don't know like whether you've, you've ever scrolled like right you'll see in 2016 my my Maya Fisher macros uh, kind of approached things it was terrible well like, carried really, away uh, and I think this is because of like the post show period yeah I was, wasn't really recovered properly but yeah. you'll see the evolution of uh, Jack Ad Fitness's Fisher <laughs> macros takes the piss out of things so <laughs> nice. again nutrition approaches they've definitely changed as as I've gone more into the off season right um, but yeah, like it wasn't good. Like I was just, I was having like donuts with every like every, every night just because chicken and donuts. <laughs> yeah, it was. It wasn't good. It was not good. <laughs> so what, was, what was your total off season time then? So you competed this year. So when did you when did you start your off season to finish? Yeah, um, so it was twenty sixteen. Like I didn't really properly start my off season um, because I spent a lot of time back in twenty fifteen when it, when the shows finished. Uh, struggling to recover with the diet right. so reversing out pro probably too slow so that was again a mistake that I made and now I'm more knowledgeable I kind of know not to do that yeah um, I'd, I'd say properly started it in 2016 and then it finished in March 2018 so that was kind of the, the total off season length which nice. roughly about 20, 27 months um, of being pretty much in a gaining phase for most of that period cool. with mini cuts um, and a few maintenance periods. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Um, so, okay. So let's talk about training then. So you said kind of upper lower was what you ran for most of that time. Yeah. So upper lower was basically the only thing that I kind of ran during that period. Yeah. Um, looking back, I wish I'd run other splits, but this is something that I've try and teach to a lot of people and my clients as well it's, it's just it's all based on kind of your lifestyle and your job yeah like my job only ever allowed me to do four days a week training so i kind of yep. had to utilize what i could during that time yep. and up lower for four days a week i feel that's the most optimal um with regards to four days per week training yeah the focus of the off season itself it was hamstrings and back oh, okay. so both leg days were pretty much just hammering the hamstrings as much as I could do, um, and also back as well on the other days. So yeah, it was just four days per week for a good sort of two year period. And, right. And that, yeah, that was kind of really, really it until now. Now, I've, now I'm a full time online coach. I can train more. Yeah. Um, so I'm actually doing a lot more training now, which is great. Nice. Uh, so I'm actually excited to see 
when I can get into an off season, the yeah. progress I can make because I can now train more. So. For sure, awesome. So how did you how did you allocate volume for that upper lower split? Like obviously hammies and back took a lot of it. So did you do you know less of others, or did you just stay in the gym longer? What did yeah. you do that way? So it kind of I had obviously touch points during during the off season itself, but the majority was hamstrings and back. Yep. And I would say probably for if we're talking about working sets yep. um, and actual the exercises that we're doing, I'd say probably hamstrings were always at sort of fifteen plus sets per week, um, and then back again up the same as well at sort of. 15 plus sets and, and the way it kind of worked was week one obviously you'd have like fairly low volumes and as we got towards like the end of the training block it would get increasingly harder right. as the sets came up as the loads came up as well as my body weight came up as well mm-hmm. so all of those obviously came into play um but I, I wouldn't say like everything else just kind of was it was in the background because I, I felt like I could just do everything like I could probably look at yeah. game on my chest, on my shoulders, so I kind of push as much as I can, but as you probably know, with upper lower splits, you're restricted to time, yeah. how much you can actually do, so yeah. there's always there's always the element of you just need to be kind of, I guess, focused on a few points rather than everything, because you can be in the gym three hours doing it. Oh, work. yeah, yeah, for sure. If you're trying to hit everything for like 15 sets, you yeah. there a while. But pretty often it would be, there would be a compound of, of, of an upper movement and there would be an accessory right. and then any focus points so for back there would be then another accessory or a metabolite section for it as well yep. so the, the priority point had more sets given to it and more exercises as well um, so that was really kind of the focus and then everything just kind of came up alongside of it nice now let's talk about uh cardio wise in the off season did you do much of it or you know very little yeah yeah, that's what I thought. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm not, I'm not big on cardio in the off season. Um, obviously, like be healthy, go yeah. for walks. Yeah. Um, involved in sports, like for example, I probably will start playing things like squash or badminton again in an oh, cool. off season with my friends because I enjoy it. Yeah. Uh, but in terms of actual daily cardio, it's never really been a big thing for me in an off season. But the, the way I, the way I look at it is I want to be rested and recovered for my sessions as much as possible. Exactly. Like, if I know I've got a big PB coming up on a squat where I want to achieve a certain rep goal or a rep or, or an actual weight on the bar, doing the cardio for me is probably going to be counterproductive yep. and I'm not going to be fueling that session efficiently because I would have probably wasted energy on the cardio itself. So I think cardio has its place for sure and I probably won't let myself get too far away from it I'll, I'll keep including things like daily walks in yep uh, because my job's now very very inactive for sit sure. down all day yeah um, but yeah I've, I've, cardio in the off season for me it's, it's it's again it's just kind of I think you need to do something for enjoyment so if you're playing a sport with your friends cool crack on go and do that but I wouldn't go out of your way to include cardio yep. if, if, you, if you don't need it because that is the tool that you need when you start cutting. I think it's a tool that you should have in your kind of back pocket, ready for when the cut begins. Yeah. Not doing tons of cardio in your off season. So that's that's just my thoughts on it. I know everybody's got their own approach to it. Yeah. Um, and their own opinions. I know people that are in off seasons that do cardio daily, but yeah, that's just um, it's never been my thing. Yeah. Even even for for me, I, I lean towards your kind of way of looking at it. Like for me, I'm like okay. If I've got like X amount of calories for this off season to try to allocate to like building muscle and stuff, and I'm going to burn some of those doing cardio just for the sake of it, like why would I do that? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 100% agree. So, yeah. so <laughs> what about, what about diet in the off season? How did you handle that? So I, I kind of have, have a flexible and a, 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 a I guess a, a tailored approach. Right. Um, for example, on days of the week, I will track, but I'll track every day. Yep. And then when it comes to the weekend, I usually just free ball. So I kind of just estimate, I eat to my hunger, and then I'll, I will track some protein. I'll have an idea of my protein intake. Yep. Um, and then 
So it's almost, it just gives me a, rela- a, a relaxing from tracking every single day yeah. um, in the off-season. Because you do it, obviously, in a cup, and I understand you need to. But in an off-season, I like to have a few days of the week where I'm not binging or I'm not having cheat meals or anything. I'm just not tracking. Like yeah. I'm not I'm not having to scan everything into my fitness pal yeah. or with every bit of food. I'm I'm just mindfully getting enough protein in yep. and using enough calories. And as long as my body weight is still progressively going up, like I feel that's just a nice approach to take. Um, it gives you that, that chill time away from constantly tracking. Yeah. Um, but it's something I think in my next off season I'm probably gonna I might drop that and actually Full on track everything, um, oh. just to see if it really does make a difference in regards to training. Yeah, I guess when you think about it, if you're having two days of the week where perhaps carbs might be drastically lower, yeah, the training on Monday might not be as good. Yep. So this little is just things. yeah, I, I've learned a little bit more about. Um, so yeah, I get every, again like the approaches everybody has is different, but that's kind of the way I feel. It gives me the re- the relax from tracking yeah. all the time because yeah. it can it can get like quite tedious. I feel yeah. you know too, right? Like after like doing it for so long, like you know, okay, this is probably like five ounces of chicken, right? Yeah, and like cool. you can just kind of haphazardly scoop some rice out, and you're like, that's probably a cup, right? You yeah. know, you know, and like once you learn like the the macros behind the foods, it's pretty easy to figure out after doing yeah. it for years and years and years, right? Yeah, exactly. And I, I, I eat most of the same foods in an off-season anyway. Yeah. So, for example, if I'm going to wake up and have the same foods I would normally eat when I track, yeah. and I kind of know I'm there or thereabouts with my things, I just might switch around some things if I go for a meal out. Um, and as long as you're not getting too fat and the scales aren't going up too fast, yeah. I know I'm doing a pretty good job of it. But, again, yeah. that's kind of the approach I like to take with it. it gives you that relax from sure. tracking all the time. Yeah, exactly. Now, touch on your kind of approach when you're dieting so if you follow like a flexible approach how flexible are you like sometimes you see people like okay i've got this much carbs and then at the end of the won't eat carbs all day and then at the end of the day they've got that little tub of ben and jerry's like are you flexible slash clean or or more like what side do you lean to more yeah so back in 2015 i was flexible with everything like every meal was can I fit this into this? Can yeah. I fit this into this? Like, I need to be able to fit such and such amount of yogurt into this, or this amount of fruit, or this amount of right. uh, this puffs. Like, but th- this preps has been totally different, and I guess that again has come with the knowledge that I've learned. Um, I'm I'm pretty much I, I would say I'm pretty much a clean eater. I guess as as or, or, or a pro dieter because my meals are the same pretty much every day. So breakfast is the same, lunch is the same, um, dinner is usually the same sort of food source, yep. and then evening meal might change a tiny bit. So I guess I'm, I'm somewhat flexible, somewhat clean. Um, I don't, I'm not married to one approach, yep. but I feel like in prep now, you need to be consistent. Yeah, like you need to be consistent with your foods every day, and having that element there of you know what you're going to eat every day. It takes takes away that kind of that decision fatigue of yep. can I fit into my macros? Will like is it? And again, it's almost are those foods worth it as well? Yeah. Um, like I, I'm quite happy to have like a, t- a pint of Halo top and stuff at night, but that will be consistent yeah. for like eight nine weeks. Yeah. I won't just suddenly random fit it in. It will just be a consistent factor into my day. Right. So. I guess yeah, I am flexible and but I'm very routine with my food choices. Yep. I don't I don't really stray too far each yeah. meal within. It's always the same kind of foods each day. Um, just with a little bit of flexibility on the side of it. So I feel that's that's been the best way for me for this prep. Um, it's worked really, really well so far. Yep. Um, in regards to controlling things like satiety, uh, my session performance is usually really good. Like yep. because foods are usually on point as well like within the, the, the meals leading up to it so yeah that's that's my approach um, but compared to back to 2015 it was awful it was awful just, <laughs> I was just trying to fit everything into my macros like nice. I'd, I'd spend an hour a day trying to fit <laughs> probably a donut into my macros or some cereal and it just yeah it, it just messed with my head yeah so so now the night before I 
I'll type all of my foods in. Yep. And if for some reason I've got a craving for something, I'll find a way to fit it in. I'll be done with it. Yeah. But compared to back in 2015, oh, it was awful. <laughs> yeah. That comes with experience too, right? Yeah. L- okay. Learning, learning what works and what doesn't. Yeah. I, I think again, like you the, the, the flexible diet is largely dictated by home life as well. If you've got girlfriends, yeah. like a wife, kids, yeah. You don't want to be having to eat different meals to them yeah. all the time because it, it creates arguments, it creates these things where it's not a good place to be in. So I think if you can have a little bit of flexibility with them yeah. and then all of your meals like uh, uh, without them throughout the day are the same, then that's I think that's the perfect way yeah, to go that's, about it. That's, that's a smart approach. Yeah. Awesome. Touch on, uh, do you, do you believe in like, uh, like nutrient timing and stuff? Like do you try to have X amount around your workout or, you know, this much food in you before training? Like for me, for example, I know that like, like I'm usually training in the morning, maybe like 11, 12 o'clock. I know there's an immediate difference between two meals. If I can fit it in between personal training clients versus one meal and like a little bit of pre-workout sit back. I know that if I eat a little bit more, especially on like a higher intensity day, maybe like a hard leg day or like a big back workout, I know that that little extra carbs makes a difference. So give me your thoughts on that. For sure. Yeah. I think nutrient time in it's definitely got its place um, with with everyone's diet. Um, It's funny because actually as this prep's gone on, my, 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 the times of the day that I train have changed based on how I feel. Yep. So like for a good five months, I was training at sort of three, four o'clock every day and I had to have three meals. Like I had to have had three whole meals. Is it, I'm not necessarily a certain carbohydrate intake before I trained, but I had to have three meals in me because I knew it filled me up. I knew it sort of got me energized, ready for my training sessions. Yep. The last, I'd say sort of month and a bit is I've, I can actually now train off of one meal which is really okay. strange. I yeah. have no idea why. That's interesting. But I just feel more energized straight after breakfast. Um, so I'll have my breakfast. Which is what? Just hour. touch on that real quick. What's your breakfast? What would you have? Literally just protein. Um, it's protein ice cream. So it's basically two scoops of protein, um, ice and almond milk, all in a blender. And then it just it comes out really, really thick. So oh. it's basically a protein shake. Um, but really? it's... It, if you put more ice into the blender yep. um, and the milk, it comes out like a really nice consistency. Huh. Um, and, I'll, and I'll have that with either like a bagel um, or like a protein bar. So that is basically now something that I train really well off because really? it, it is it's very strange. I'm not sure why it's kind of, why it's apparent that I can now train really well off of that because yep. in the past I had to have loads of food. Yeah. But, but now I guess I kind of, the way the way I look at my training, I like to chill after my training and get nice food in after that. Yeah, yeah. So it hasn't it hasn't affected session performance. So again, it, it almost it works. It, ask the question whether it's a mindset kind of thing, whether yeah. you need those meals. Yeah. I, in the past, I've never wanted to train before twelve o'clock. Yeah. Like, never wanted to train in the morning. Yeah. But now, yeah, I'm loving it. Like, I, I think it's the best thing I've done so far. And and again, when when my off season comes into play again, that will probably change. I think I'll probably then start to need loads of carbs because I just want to fuel my training a bit more. So yeah, it's 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 funny how my my look on it has changed. But nutrient timing, I, I still think it's a great idea to get a good amount of carbs in pre and post workout. Yeah. Um, post workout is still quite a carb heavy meal. Um, yeah, I'm a I'm a big fan of like the larger like. 30 minutes after my workout, like I'll come home, either throw, you know, a podcast on or something on TV and just like get my plate and just, just chill. Uh, I can almost feel like my muscles like soaking it up and it's probably purely psychological, but you just feel like, all right, refueling, things are growing, feeling better. And, and like, I, I'm a big fan of like that post-workout big meal. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's funny because I, I, I reckon in an off season it will change. I, I think I'll probably end up changing the time of the day that I train. But right now, just I'm trying to train at times that I actually just feel good yep. and feel like I'm not sluggish. Um, and that is sort of 10, 11 in the morning, which is 
good for me, I guess, at the minute, because then it gives me the rest of the day to yeah. chill, get my food in, get work done. So, yeah, it's, it's uh, quite nice at the minute. Awesome, awesome. Okay, let's talk about your, your online business now. So you've been at it for a year. Tell me how that kind of came into play, what led you to that, and, you know, challenges and stuff you face, what you've done, all that good yeah. stuff. So it was back in, to, after I finished my prep in 2015, during sort of that, that, that time period, it was kind of, I knew I wanted to get into it, yep. but I never really knew how to, like I never really knew what to do to make the jump. Right. So I spent 2016 just learning, but like, I didn't, I didn't take any online clients on, I just spent 2016 just learning about my physique, writing my own training programs, yep. trying different things, um, and yeah, just, just like just YouTube everything. Like I was just listening to podcasts, reading articles, downloading books. I think I attended a few seminars as well. Yep. Um, and I just wanted to learn. And I just learned as much as I could. And I think that's the best thing that anyone can do is when they're looking to get into being an online coach is just to go and learn. Yeah. It's the best thing like to get yourself in the right the right readiness, ready to coach people. For sure. Um, and then I guess like a bit of a flip switch back in, I think it was 2017 at the start of the year. I knew I wanted to get into coaching and I knew it was kind of the route which I wanted to take. Um, after being coached, mm -hmm. it was something that I enjoyed the experience of. I knew I wanted to do that as a job. Yep. Um, so I started taking people on for free, um, which is what a lot of people don't do yeah. straight away. They want to start earning money for being a coach, yep. but I, I, I think the best thing you can do as a coach is start coaching people for free. So I took five people on um, for a month to test my services. Now, how, test, did, how did they find you or, or vice versa? How did you find them? Just for Instagram. So, yep. so during during the period of like 2016, I was posting content. So yep. I was just posting free information, whether it was stupid if a fish and macros meals, Yep. or training footage, yep. um, like Transformation Tuesdays, whatever it was, yep. I, I was still posting content throughout that period. Yep. And I, I literally just put out on a post, like, I'm looking for five people to take online um, and coach for free. And I think I had, like, at the time, like, my Instagram was, it was probably more engaged than it is now. I think I had, like, 50 requests oh, to, wow. be, to, to, to take up on this offer to be coached. And I was like, okay. Um, so I, I kind of pin-picked who I wanted yep. based on what they were looking to achieve, whether they would fit me right as well. Yep. So I coached them for a month, um, gave them the whole works of what a, a fully paying online client would get. Yep. Um, and yeah, it kind of just grew from there really. So those five people, what they gave me was the, the testimonials to, to know that of what I was doing. Yep. So they, they gave me the platform to put out online that, I was actually good at what I was doing. I could get people results. Cool. And then from there, it's just created a bit of a snowball effect. Yeah. So it gave me the chance this year to be able to leave my job at the time because um, wow. I was still working, still uh, having online clients for all of 2017. So for a year before I even left my job, I was still doing that, doing check-ins on weekends, doing programs sort yep. of at work, which I shouldn't really have been doing, but... My work was easy Whatever. at the time, yeah. so I thought, why not? Yeah. Um, and yeah, so been doing it full time as such now for uh, roughly about five months um, since February. So yeah, really, uh, really sort of a cool background, I guess, from where I was to where I am now. So nice. very, very happy. Now do, you, now, do you take on just prep clients or do you take like, you know, the average Joe who wants to lose weight or gain muscle? What's your niche, yeah. I guess? So. I've got a few people who are lined up for preps next year, but the majority of my clients are what you would probably, I guess, consider as the general gym goer. Yep. But they are still into the advanced levels of training because right. they, they've kind of, I guess, they've surpassed general gym goer yep. where any training program will work right. to where now they need tailored volumes for everything to be able to maximize their lifts, maximize their recovery. Yep. Um, yeah, like I, I'd say the majority of, of my clients are general population and then like a very small amount is uh, is contest prep yeah. in readiness for next year. So that'll be really cool because I, I haven't taken anyone to the stage yet. So I've got cool. a few people that will be lined up ready for next year. So I'm really excited for that. Nice, nice. Now what's your, what's your demographic, age, gender? It's males that are over 20. Yeah. Um, uh, I guess 
they, they want to maximize their training as much as possible. Yeah. Um, at the start, it was kind of just anyone who was a flexible dieter that wanted to drop body fat. Yeah. But as, as my kind of my, my knowledge and the, the people I find best to work with, is now people that are just wanting to give everything to their training. Like cool. that's the best thing about their day. Their mind is always on their training. Their mind is always about PB and their lifts. Like yeah. that's now the people that I really like to work with. Um, and it's kind of showing with sort of the, the, the new sort of consoles that I have, that those are the type of people that I'm picking up now. So that's nice. really cool to be able to have those. Awesome. Now what's your, what's your kind of, uh, how do I say this? Like protocol for how people, so you get like an email request and then do you do like a video chat and then go from there? How do you structure everything? Yeah. So obviously they'll have the consultation form that they'll fill in. Yeah. Um, and then on that, it's basically just a phone call or a video chat or um, whatever kind of chat. As long as I can speak to them before yeah. I get set up, that's the main thing. Cool. Um, because I know a lot of coaches out there that will just literally They'll, they'll get height, they'll get weight, and then they'll send them a program. I want to know a lot about my clients. I yeah. want to know kind of why they've come to me, what they're struggling with, yeah. if they've got any holidays coming up, what their goals are, what their long-term goals are. And I, I just want to set the tone straight away. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, that's kind of the protocol that I go for at the minute. Um, so, yeah, I sort of make sure I always get them on the phone to have a chat. Yeah. That's awesome. And then same with check-ins. Do you do like a video chat or a phone call for yeah. check-ins? So they've got their training sheets to fill in throughout the week. And then it's a, it's a video check-in. So basically I'll record myself going over their training sheets, yep. talking about sort of any changes to their nutrition, to their training. Um, perhaps I, I, need, I can see that they're struggling with their carbs. I'll then give them ideas on what carb sources, which is going to help them out a bit more. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it, I don't necessarily do Skype videos with right. each client because that will take an incredibly long time with every single client. Um, and it's efficient for them as well because they've got their sheets to fill in. Yep. I'll film a video, send them their feedback, and then they've got it there for the day. So awesome. yeah, video checking is much faster than emails as well. Yeah, I, I, sure. I think yeah. that's my where, where are most of your clients? Are they over in the UK with you or are you kind of a little bit broader spectrum? So the last um, the last few clients that I've taken on have been a bit more international. I've had a few from Brazil. Um, oh, cool. Got some in, um, in in America as well, which is which is brilliant. Um, and but yeah, most of them are UK based. Yeah. Um, not actually around my hometown, which is oh. funny to think. Like it's a sort of they're all kind of spread about the UK, but not many in my hometown. Yeah, that's awesome. That's awesome. Okay, um, few random notes that I just had, just that. You know, we bounce around a lot. So supplements, what's your take and view on supplements? How much stock do you put in supplements? What do you take, if anything? Talk about that a little bit. Yeah, yeah cool. So supplements, I, I'm I'm on the sort of, on the look of, they're not a necessity, yeah. but definitely going to help you. Like, I, I feel things like creatine monohydrate. The reality is you need to eat a lot of beef to get creatine monohydrate into yeah. your system. So supplementing that is a good idea. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah. proven it works. Yeah, yeah, it's proven supplement for yeah. sure. And just give you a list of the ones that I take and the ones I feel will probably benefit is whey protein, obviously. Yep. Like that's going to help you hit your macro goals. So that's always one for me. Um, definitely Mutant Nation is the best, the best uh, tasting one for sure. Right. Um, and then creatine monohydrate. Uh, multivitamins as well because you can never be too short of vitamins. And especially in a deficit as well. Yeah. The reality is you're not going to be probably getting enough vitamins in anyway. Totally. So supplementing that is always a good idea. Same with fish oil. Uh, okay. As fat gets incredibly low in prep for me, because carbs always try and the, the carbs will always stay as high as possible. My fats will drop probably below forty. Right. Um, I need to supplement some kind of fish oil um, to make sure I'm getting good omega three in, in um, into my diet. Yep. Then things like pre-workouts, I have to have a pre-workout, otherwise my session is crap. And I think that's I think that's a mental thing as well. Um, <laughs> but no, I have to have a pre-workout in me. Yeah. Um, and yeah, that's pretty much it. I don't take any BCAs or intra-workouts at the minute. Right. I probably will start using intra-workout again in the off season. Okay. But I'm sure you know as well. Like when you diet down, you want to eat your food. Yeah, um, yeah. I you don't want to drink anything. Like, I don't want to drink carbs. No yeah. way. Yeah. No way. 
Does that stay – now, do those one, two, three, four, five stay consistent from prep to off-season? Like, that's just, okay, these are the supplements I take always? Yeah, yeah, that's it. And, and the only addiction really is, like I said, I might – I've been ha- I've been playing around with ashwagandha a little bit, actually, at the minute, okay. um, just to see if that makes any difference in regards to my sleep and cortisol. Um, and I'd say it probably does, actually. It's pretty, it's pretty good, so yeah. I quite, quite enjoy that. Um, but yeah, like the only real difference in an off season is just an increase in having more whey protein powder, more yeah. protein bars and stuff, just because of calories and stuff. Yeah. I'm very simple with regards to supplements. Um, things like digestive enzymes, I've never really played about with or, 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 or tried, so yeah. I can't really comment on it. Yeah. But I think it's something that I will start to use as I go into an off season, um, yeah. which is a bit more tracked and I'll be more knowledgeable for. So yeah. Awesome. Awesome. All right, man. We're going to finish this off with just like a rapid fire, just some quick questions, quick uh, Q&A. What is your biggest pet peeve in the gym? <laughs> biggest pet peeve in the gym. Everyone, the thing is, everyone's probably going to say leaving dumbbells out or stuff. Um, but mine is when I'm doing an exercise and in the mirror and then someone walks in front of you. <laughs> like Because I, I, I'm, not lo- I'm not looking in the mirror to look at myself. I'm yeah. looking to see that my depth and my form is all good. Yeah. You're on a bench and then someone walks in front of you it's just like oh man like, it's just the get most out of my annoying, way <laughs> most annoying thing in the world or when someone nicks your plates <laughs> yeah yeah freak jerks <laughs> favorite uh, body part to train favorite body part to train so in an off season it's definitely legs but at the minute in prep like leg days they're just not the same anymore um <laughs> So in, in, in prep, I would say it's now back. Back's my favorite thing to train in prep. Okay. It's, uh, it's the least fatiguing, um, and I get the most enjoyment out of it as well. Yeah. So with that in mind, on a back day, what's like two or three exercises you're for sure going to hit? Um, definitely a dumbbell row. Okay. That's like one of the sub. It's either like a dumbbell row or a T-bar row. Yep. Um, and then a pull down. That's definitely like my go-to is a row and a pull down for sure. Yep. And then if I'm kind of like trying to target my lats a bit more, there might be more pull down elements to it. Right, right. Now, what's like, uh, what's the day that we love everything about training, but what's the day that gets you maybe like least excited? <laughs> what do you mean like a rest day? <laughs> <laughs> True. Or, or, or training. Yeah, training day. Like for me, um, it was weird. When I was younger, I just wanted big arms, right? So arm day was like the best day of life. But now that I'm more into like bodybuilding and like actually sculpting my physique, like I'm the same as you, like leg day just because it's so freaking hard. And then uh, and then like back day is pretty enjoyable. But arms now, like it doesn't excite me as much. I love it still, but it's not like true love. What, do you have yeah, a, no, a, a workout? The same and, that, and that's and that's the same in an off season as well. Yeah. And that's what, probably why my arms never grow that much is because <laughs> when it comes to it, my actual intent for every set is never there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, it's just arms. It's just, like, arms. Just, just just do what I need to do, and then yeah, yeah, that'll be it. So yeah, things like RPEs and intensity when it comes to arms, just stand right out the window. <laughs> <laughs> now, do you put do you put any any effort into like? smaller muscle groups like forearms and calves or anything like that uh forearms no the only thing i really do for forearms is hammer curls like okay. they're gonna get some kind of uh muscle activation from a hammer curl but never i've like never done specific yep. forearm exercises yeah uh, calves every leg workout um so twice a week and usually about four or five sets yep so like as many sets as i can do on them they can probably take more of a beat in, I reckon. So I think something I'll look at doing in the off season is including more calves on upper body days as well. Yep. Because I find that they don't really get fatigued that much because yeah. that's just such a small muscle group. Yeah, exactly. What about abs? Core training at all? Abs. So yeah, abs fall on leg days as well. So again, like four or five sets on 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 a leg day. Yep. Um. Yeah, twice a week usually for abs. What well, What would be a typical like ab session look like? I don't. I get. I guess I don't really do sessions. I'll just do like four or five sets at the end of a leg day, and it'll okay. be like a cable crunch or a hanging leg raise, um, or like a decline weighted sit up. Um, so yeah, I, I, this is the thing. Like my abs, they've never been a standout point for me, and okay. it's probably something I need to revisit because I need to train them harder. Yeah. And make have like an ab session yeah. as such to be a bit more dedicated to it. 
I'm like the worst person to get app advice from. <laughs> do you put any stock in like the, oh, don't do like heavy, you know, oblique work. It's going to make your waist wider. Like, do you believe that crap? Or do you think like your waist is what it is? No, I think that's a load of crap. I think you look at people like uh, Chris Bumstead in his off season and he's hammering deadlifts. Yeah. Look at his waist. Yeah, it's sucked in like crazy. I saw a picture he posted today and I'm like, oh my God. Yeah, he's, he's, not, he's, he's the man crush that's been it. Yeah, yeah. Um, favorite cheat meal? Like, I, obviously, you take a little bit of a flexible approach, but what's like, I don't know, after a show, you're like, all right, this is this is going down right now. Yeah. It's, it's funny because, like, at, throughout this prep, things like my, my, my cravings have changed. At the start, it was all pizza. Like, it was like, I need pizza, I need pizza. Yeah. But now, now it's donuts, so I, I, I'm, I'm going to hammer some donuts post-show. <laughs> And like I know, it's everybody thinks that it's weak that you, you look forward to your cheat meal post show. I don't I don't care about that. I'm I'm definitely going to have donuts. Nice. Um, you guys get better donuts than than we do here in the UK. <laughs> we've only got Krispy Kreme. So. Oh, we've got we've got some vicious donuts over here, my friend. I know you do. <laughs> <laughs> when is your show, by the way? When I don't think we touched on that. When's your show? So my sh- my show is in the next uh, eight and nine weeks. I've got two shows. I've got two finals that I've qualified for. Um, the first one is on the twenty first of October, and then the second one's on the twenty eighth. So and what are those? Awesome. What are those called? What's the names? It's the UK DFBA finals. So that show qualifies you for the WMBF World if you win your class. Right. And then the one the week after is the MPA finals. Um, which I think qualified you for the WNBB. It's it's not I don't, it's not the WNBF, but it's something else. I can't remember what it was. Um, so yeah, the, the goal really is like the UK DFBA finals. I'd love to get like it's, it's difficult. I don't want to. I'd, I'd love to win. Obviously, like I'm going there to to win. Um, but the goal I set out at the start of the year was to get top three in a middleweight category um, because. Weighted categories in the UK, like the standard, is just it's insane now. Yeah, you guys are crazy over there. Like, like in Canada, the natural scene like isn't big. It as shitty as that is. Like, like I've been like like these interview things. I've been trying to like like find people and like yourself, Jack Thorburn, AJ Morris. Like you guys are all who I keep contacting because we're the only ones on the same page. Like I'm trying to find guys around here and it's impossible. Is it? Yeah, it really is. Like, it, and it's just, it sucks, but it's the reality of the situation. Like for me, like I wanna, I wanna go up to the WNBF, and the closest show to me is in New York, which is in the states. Yeah. So, that's the reality of it. Yeah, and it, I guess like the natural scene in the UK only does keep growing. Like, you you only need to look at the novice classes who are first time bodybuilders and they're stepping on stage with shredded glutes. Yeah, and, well, it's crazy. Uh, striated quads and it's just nuts yeah so it shows, i guess it shows the standard and, and the way it's growing here in the uk which is great to see yeah uh, so yeah it's just it's more difficult to get to the w wmbf i think in the uk now so yeah but, where where would worlds be if you qualified uh, i think the worlds are in boston or it's in um or we actually know it's in la this year i think yes in uh, la so Sweet. yeah and then the worlds for the other competition i'm competing at is in um I think it's in Barcelona, I think, is, is that one. So, yeah. So, start saving I, your I, money. I, I'd love to make a world finals. That would be amazing. That's and that sick. is definitely a big goal that I've got. But, like I said, at the start of the year, I set out to want to achieve top three. Anything anything better is kind of like just icing on the cake for me. Yeah. But I will be competing to win on a day. Like, there's oh, no yeah. doubt about it. That's awesome, man. Good. That's awesome. Good for you. Okay, last one. What is your two or three pieces of advice for the new lifter coming into the game? Uh, young guy getting into the gym. He needs to know a few things. What do you got for him? <laughs> um, so, like I said, just just train for, train and eat if you're a young lifter. Yeah. Stop worrying about the small stuff. Stop worrying about whether you need X amount of carb yeah. or at certain meals. Just train, eat, progressive, progressively over your this. Um, and make sure you're gaining weight if you're looking to gain muscle as well. Yeah. Um, and the second one is just patience. Like this, yeah. That's this huge, eh? No one has patience anymore for this. Uh, this natural bodybuilding thing is is a slow, slow process. 
And although you can make very fast progress, the majority of it, when you're getting into your training years, it is slow. Yeah. And the more you stress about not making progress as fast as others, the more you're probably going to fall out of love with the sport. Yeah. So you just need to be patient, do the right things. Like, obviously, make sure you're doing the right things and you're not just winging it, going round in, round in circles all the time. But yeah, be patient because at the end of the day, natural bodybuilding it is a sport of delayed gratification. Yeah. Um, in the last two years of my game phase, like my changes to my physique, while they may be small, I'm damn happy with it because of the work that you put in over time. And it's, yeah, it's, it worked, but it does require patience. And it's like with anything in life, um, you just got to be consistent and patient as well. Yeah, that's awesome. That's awesome. All right, man. Plug your Instagram. Plug your website if you got one. Where can people find you? Uh, so Instagram is just Jack Ab Fitness. Um, no underscores or anything. Just straight up Jack Ab Fitness. And my website is www.jackabfitness.com. Um, and you'll find in there all of my new things that I'm going to be doing. I'm just going to start doing some articles as well um, cool. on my website. And also YouTube, again, is Jack Ab Fitness. So basically just everything is... He's easy to find. <laughs> yeah, not very hard to find it at all. So yeah, that's my stuff. All right, man. Hey, this was great. I appreciate that. No problem. Thanks for having me on. I've really enjoyed it, mate. Really do appreciate it. All right, man. Well, good luck with your with your continued prep. We'll have to touch base again after the show, and, and you can discuss all the finer details of... The yeah. last eight weeks of prep. Yeah, hopefully we can get my glute shredded. That's that's the that's the goal over the next seven eight weeks. Just nice. get shredded glutes. They're yeah. the last thing to come in. Right? What do you what do you weigh right now? What's, really? your, what's your body weight at right now? Oh, uh, uh, body weight is at one. I was one sixty this morning. And what are you hoping to dip to? Probably about one five five, one five four. So okay. we'll see. I've got some digging to do, but I'm going to do it. So. Awesome. <laughs> All right, man. Well, you have a good rest of your day. Appreciate it again, and uh, we'll talk soon. Yes, buddy. Speak to you soon. Have a good one, buddy.